Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. A historic moment for the nation. President Biden today signing the Respect for Marriage Act. The bipartisan legislation codifies same-sex and interracial marriage in federal law. It's a big day for advocates, but the bill's protections are still limited. It doesn't guarantee the right to marry, but it does mandate individual states recognize same-sex marriages across state lines and ensures same sex couples are entitled to the same federal benefits as other married couples. The bill became a priority for Democrats after the Supreme Court's June decision overturning Roe v. Wade, the right to abortion access, and the high court hinted at reconsidering gay rights in its wake. If it does, the law signed by the president today stops short of preventing same-sex marriages from becoming illegal again in states that might oppose them. Still, the respect for Marriage Act marks the shifting views of both the public and politicians. In 2004, a Gallup poll found just 19 percent of Republicans supported same-sex marriage. Today, that number stands at 43 percent. The NPR PBS NewsHour Marist poll out this week finds the majority of U.S. adults support same-sex marriage. Well, on the White House South Lawn today, President Biden was joined by lawmakers and LGBTQ advocates, including some from New Jersey, hailing the signing as a step toward a, quote, more perfect union. Today's a good day. A day America takes a vital step toward equality, toward liberty and justice, not just for some, but for everyone, everyone toward creating a nation where decency, dignity, and love are recognized, honored, and protected. Today, I sign the Respect for Marriage Act into law. President Biden is also pushing to radically alter the presidential nominating calendar by placing South Carolina, a state that was good to the president during his 2020 election, as the first primary state, eliminating Iowa, which is held the first in the nation caucuses for roughly half a century. The proposal by Democrats also adds key battleground states like Nevada, Georgia, and Michigan, elevating black voters' voices while solidifying Biden's intention to run for a second term. But it's also a likely setback for Governor Murphy's potential presidential aspirations by leaving New Jersey off that list. The Bergen Record columnist Charlie Style joins me now to talk about how this could upend Murphy's plans. Charlie Style, good to talk to you. As always, you wrote this week about President Biden sort of turning on its head the primary schedule. I guess the main question is, what did Governor Murphy stand to gain by having New Jersey in as one of those early states? Oh, he's, he, he, he would have gotten a lot, uh, a lot of publicity. Um, the nation by that time would be really primed for the big show, the big nominating circus that begins every four years. And it would begin right here in New Jersey. And he would be, if he had thrown his hat in the ring, um, not only the candidate, but the um, the go-to ambassador for the state. You'd have every TV crew, uh, you know, lining up to talk to him. But you pointed out, and as we all know, the odds were stacked against him anyway. I mean, New Jersey is a reliable democratic state. So, you know, right. why would they have chosen uh, a blue state like Jersey to begin with? That was a tall order to start. Exactly. I mean, I think the the real concern in this, particularly in this polarized generation that we're in, is to win the battleground states, the ones that uh, are trending, that had been 
red and now are trending into the purple zone like Georgia and to a degree Michigan and um, North Carolina, which was not on the list. But uh, that's where the real state of play is. New Jersey is uh, an automatic Democratic lever. And why, why waste resources here? If you think of the primary as sort of spring training for the general election, in, in, in that context, you want to spend time, money, and visibility and build visibility in battleground states because those are the ones you're going to need in November. New Jersey, though, as you wrote, I mean, made a pretty good case. We've got sort of this melting pot of residents. Folks would really, candidates, you know, would really have to uh, stump hard here as opposed to some place like in Iowa or in New Hampshire. Does this really, though, put the nail in the coffin for Murphy? I mean, he's been saying, you know, Charlie, for months that he would support Biden <laughs> if he chose to, ran, to run again. The talk about Murphy running for president was always predicated on the possibility that Biden would not seek another term and that there might be some chaos in the Democratic Party, if a party-wide scramble to find a consensus candidate. So in that kind of milieu, maybe Phil Murphy, it, it, it didn't harm him to kind of prepare a resume and grow out his hair <laughs> and uh, put together uh, you know, a, a network of contacts through the the national governors associations that are Democratic governors association. Why not? Why not at least put yourself on the perimeter as a possibility? But I think after this announcement, this new primary calendar advanced by Biden, it's very clear that he is uh, has every intention of running again. And he'll probably enter that race, a very strong and formidable candidate. Charlie Style, thank you so much. You're more than welcome. Meanwhile, in Trenton, it's election day yet again. Voters are choosing candidates in a hotly contested runoff for city council with two seats, one in the North Ward and another in the South, up for grabs. After a judge intervened over disputes whether the candidates received the 50 percent of votes needed to clear the election. In the North Ward, Trenton's Republican Municipal Chair Jennifer Williams faces Algernon Ward, a scientist for the state health department who's already made a bid for the council twice before. Now, if she wins, Williams would be New Jersey's first ever openly transgender council member. And in the South Ward, Mercer County Parks employee Damian Malave squares off against Jenna Figueroa Kettenberg, who works as an investigator for the State Department of Children and Families. But it doesn't end here. The city still has one more runoff. That's in January, and it's for the council's three coveted at-large seats. One silver lining from the pandemic, more emphasis put on the importance of school meals and the need to include nutritious, wide-ranging options for kids. This week, hundreds of school food service directors are gathering for a conference where they'll preview menu items for the upcoming school year and reignite the conversation over the tens of thousands of students who'd benefit from a statewide free school lunch program. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has the story. We want to feed our kids. That's what we're here to do. We're here to feed our kids. That's why Arlethea Brown from Camden Schools toured tables for more than 40 vendors loaded with turkey bites and tater tots and chicken tacos, packaged peaches and pepperoni pizza. She's looking for something healthy beyond basic. Now, don't get me wrong. I love a slice of pizza, but I want that slice of pizza to have a little broccoli on there, tomatoes, onions, maybe some peppers. And that's something that we want to introduce to our students. About 350 food service officials from school districts across New Jersey shopped and sampled meal items, previewing next year's school lunch and breakfast menus. Currently, 42 percent of New Jersey's 1.2 million students benefit from free and reduced price meals. It's part of the U.S. Department Department of Agriculture school lunch program for participating districts. The french fries are probably not a hard sell. They're not. Everybody <laughs> needs a starch and like I said, children love french fries. The purpose of school food service is to feed and nurse the kids' bodies and minds so that way they can learn. If they go to school and 
they don't want to eat it, then they're not being nursed. Warren DeShields got $6 million in federal food funding to spend in his Bridgeton district where everybody's eligible for the free school lunch program. He's looking for Asian vegetable dishes and Mexican entrees to spice up the menu. But meals must meet strict government guidelines, each serving a fruit, vegetable, grain, protein, and milk without too much salt or fat. And cultural tastes impact choices. We have a lot of Latinos in our um, um, population and a lot of blacks and we're used to having you know salt and sodium in our diets and we understand that it needs to be cut out because you know we need to eat healthier but you still got to have some of that flavor. If it doesn't taste good the kids aren't going to eat it and that's the hardest part. Vince Nardone says kids tastes change. He now offers 350 different items. A stuffed crust, a Mexican, um, then we have a garlic one. New Jersey's Department of Agriculture participates. It's launching a new $5 million program to bring more Jersey fresh produce into schools. Vendors also consider school staffing capacity. Would they spoon out hundreds of diced peach servings or hand out peach cups? They're ready to use and put right on the line, no labor required. Back in 2020, Congress issued waivers that let schools offer free meals to every student, regardless of family income, during the pandemic. Essentially, it was was free school lunches for all, but those waivers expire this coming June. To qualify for free school meals, families must now earn no more than 130 percent of the federal poverty level, about 51,000 for a family of four. New Jersey lawmakers recently raised the income cap to qualify more kids and anteed up four and a half million dollars to help those eligible for reduced price meals. But at the end of the day, you still need to fill out paperwork to determine if you're eligible in most districts. And that means that some kid is going to fall through the cracks. But that wouldn't happen with universal free meals. New Jersey Senator Teresa Ruiz sponsored a resolution urging Congress to enact free school meals for all. But New Jersey has been leading the way effectively with people who are passionate about this issue. And I think as we move forward, we could potentially continue to group in more and more families. She says universal free meals is a topic that's ripe for budget discussion. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Tonight, a deeper look at community police relations in one of the state's largest cities, where recent reports detail a string of incidents involving police misconduct in Patterson that's broken trust with the department, some calling the relationship toxic. Now, law enforcement leaders there tell senior correspondent Joanna Gagas they'd support greater reforms to hold officers accountable. Once they got him in that backyard by himself, they just started shooting. Janet Rodriguez's younger brother, Thelonious McKnight, was shot and killed by Patterson police nearly a year ago. She calls it a murder. The police said that he had a gun that he fired. Has there ever been any clarity provided to the situation? None at all. December 29th makes a year since my brother has been gone. We haven't heard from anyone. The prosecutor's office, they... No, no updates. To this day, we don't even have a copy of the autopsy report. The investigation is ongoing, but the McKnight wrongful death allegation is one of several made against Patterson police in recent years. Community members say the culture is toxic. There is no relationship between the community and the um, Patterson Police Department. If there is, it's a relationship that is, you know, historically one of abuse misconduct. Mayor Andre Saya says there was police misconduct when he took office in 2018 that he's been working to address. Patterson police officers didn't wear body cameras prior to my administration. Now they wear body cameras. There was never really a thorough audit of the police department to see what type of practices were taking place. We completed that audit. One of the major recommendations was increased focus on de-escalation and training your police officers, which they've undergone the de-escalate, the extra de-escalation Training. Uniformed officers may be equipped with um, body cameras, but not plainclothes officers. And one of the things that we have known, not just in the city of Patterson, but nationwide, is that there's many instances, instances of abuse and misconduct that are occurring with officers that are plainclothes officers. As was the case with Thelonious McKnight, whose death was only captured on cell phone video taken by his brother. The calls for reform in Patterson echo those heard in Newark nearly a decade ago. One of the key differences between Newark and Patterson, about a decade ago, the city of Newark was put under a federal consent decree and the Baraka administration in Newark has loudly called for a civilian complaint review board with subpoena power. The 
FOP Lodge number 12 went into court to stop the review board. They fought it all the way up to the state Supreme Court. State Supreme Court said Newark could have a police review board, but only the state legislature could confer subpoena power. So for the past several years, we've been trying to get the state legislators to vote this bill out of committee and bring it to the floor for a vote. But even without subpoena power, Peter Harvey, who served as Newark's federal monitor, says it's been effective. The review board can examine uh, police practices, including internal affairs, closed investigations that have already occurred, and it can make recommendations to the police division, the Newark Police Division, about uh, what the community thinks can be done better, how uh, investigations can be conducted more efficiently, more thoroughly. It's just one of the reforms Captain Leonardo Carrillo says have led to Newark officers now reporting each other for excessive force. We instituted policies around uh, biased policing, community policing, stop, search, uh, and arrest practices, use of force, First Amendment, to, uh, First Amendment right to record uh, police activity. There is no federal monitor in Patterson, and critics say no one is driving the drastic changes needed to make real reform, like creating a civilian complaint review board. Do you believe that that's something that needs to come from the top, needs to be driven by the mayor's office? It did come from us. The only thing is there were council people that weren't willing to support the initiative. So that's why we're going to have to cultivate council people and enlighten them as to what the potential benefits are to restoring trust between the police and the public. He says community policing is another way to do that. Next week, we're gonna be launching for the first time Shop with a Cop. So this is just in time for the holiday season. Over 100 children in Patterson will have an opportunity to go Christmas shopping with a police officer. Officer Jordan Henry says community policing, led by his now boss, Lieutenant Sharon Easton, changed his life as a Patterson kid. I ended up becoming a police officer under her, just following her lead. So Patterson community policing have been doing great things in the city and um, they've impacted individuals like me and helped me impact other you know, youth in our city. But if this is a tale of two cities, in Patterson, it's a tale of two perspectives because many see it differently. Having coffee with one cop is it going to prevent another cop from, you know, harassing me or uh, potentially abusing me or even worse, um, shooting and killing me, right? Um, just having this one off incident may build a relationship between one person and another, but isn't going to um, solve the systemic issues that we are facing. And if Newark's an example, solutions don't come easy and real reform requires buy-in at every level. In Patterson, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. There are new hopes tonight that consumer prices could start returning to normal. Rhonda Schaffler has the latest inflation report, plus tonight's top business headlines. Hey, Rhonda. Brianna, at long last, it looks like inflation is finally peaking. Inflation has now fallen to its lowest level in a year. Today's release of the monthly consumer price index led to a collective sigh of relief from Main Street to Wall Street and at the White House. This morning, uh, we received some welcome news, in my view, and I think the view of most economists on the economic front. News that provides a reason for some optimism for the holiday season, and I would argue for the year ahead. And we learned last month's inflation rate came down, down more than experts expected. You see signs of this at the gas pump. Gas prices are now averaging about $3.41 a gallon in New Jersey, less than what we were paying a year ago. But even as inflation cools, prices for food and rent are still higher than last year. And consumer prices are still up more than 7% overall over the past year. Still, this report could change the Federal Reserve's pace of interest rate increases. The Fed will give an update on that tomorrow. New Jersey's path to reducing greenhouse gases isn't without bumps along the way. One case in point, a proposed rule mandating businesses and schools replace gas boilers with electric ones. Business groups and others oppose the rule because the replacement costs would be expensive. So for now, the state has dropped the proposal, and that's got some clean energy advocates upset. There's a lot more to this story. You can find out more by reading my colleague Tom Johnson's report on njspotlightnews.org. 
Finally, an experimental skin cancer vaccine developed by Moderna showed promise in a clinical trial, reducing the possibility of recurrence or death in patients when combined with an immunotherapy drug made by New Jersey-based Merck. Moderna's vaccine is based on the same technology used in the COVID-19 vaccines. Now, here's a look at how the stock market closed today. I'm Rhonda Schapler, and those are your top business stories. Well, the state's black bear hunt is getting a four-day extension starting tomorrow. The Department of Environmental Protection is launching a second hunt from December 14th to the 17th because not enough bears were killed during last week's shortened season. The state says 93 bears were harvested from the designated hunting zones. That translates to what's called a harvest rate, and it was 6%, which is far below the 20% goal needed to avoid a second hunt. Hunt. The decision to hold the bear hunt marked a major reversal for Governor Murphy, who vowed the 2020 season would be the last during his administration, but said he was persuaded by data showing a sharp rise in bear complaints by the public. While environmentalists are pushing back against a state plan that would essentially cut millions of trees to save millions more, a section of the Bass River State Park in the Pinelands is being targeted for a new wildfire prevention strategy, removing small saplings that often act as fuel for rapidly spreading fires. A similar approach helped limit damage during that massive Mullica River fire in June, but not all environmental advocates are buying it. Raven Santana reports. To prevent massive fires like this one in Wharton Forest last June, the New Jersey Pinelands Commission approved a plan in October to cut 2.4 million small trees like this. The goal of the plan, called the Allen Oswego Road Mitigation and Habitat Restoration Project, is to prevent major wildfires in the Bass River State Forest located in the Pine Barrens. And yes, I recognize that folks are talking about cutting 2.4 million trees. We certainly don't see it that way. Those trees that they're that we're talking about cutting are all very small. They're two eight inches or less in diameter. And we risk to lose between four to 12 million trees should a significant wildfire occur. John Cecil is assistant commissioner of the state parks, forests, and historic sites. Cecil says dense undergrowth of these smaller trees can act as ladder fuel, carrying fire from the forest floor up to the tree tops where wind can intensify and rapidly spread flames. We've realized over quite a long period of time significant fires in this portion of the Pinelands. We had a significant wildfire in 1936 that resulted in the fatality of five firefighters, another fire in 1977 that re resulted in the fatality of four firefighters, and then a fire in 1999 that would affected 11,000 acres and resulted in the significant growth and density of trees in this part of the Pinelands like we don't have in other parts of the Pinelands. Biologist Emil DeVito explains how it'll work. Thinning from the ground up. Most of the thinning happens with a mower. Not, It's not a lawnmower, it's a forestry mower. But they're not really removing any big trees. So that's the reason you're seeing this number of 2 million trees or whatever number it is. And most of them are only a few inches in diameter and they're all uh, short and bent over, and those are the things that are being removed for the most part. But they'll re-sprout anyway. The decision has received split reaction. New Jersey Pinelands Commissioner Mark Lobauer is one of two commissioners who voted against cutting down the trees. In all my study of the, that question, does thinning a forest help to reduce or slow down a wildfire? The answer is no. There's been a lot of analysis of that uh, regarding wildfires out west, California, Oregon, Washington state. They found that the thinning of a forest is not a helpful technique. In fact, it makes a wildfire burn hotter and faster. But those in favor of the plan argue it won't just keep firefighters and the surrounding community safe. It'll also preserve the ecosystem. So I'm confident that the work that we propose to do will have a positive effect on our ability to control wildfire um, in this area, and this area being one of the most dangerous, the most volatile fuel types. But even putting aside safety issues, just looking purely at ecology, what you're doing is taking a forest that has developed in the way in this incredibly crowded 
way. So you open up more of the ground to sunlight, which creates greater diversity on the forest floor. And you do end up with a native Pine Barrens forest coming out of this kind of approach. So we think it was well thought out, it was carefully thought out, and therefore we were willing to support it. The thinning is expected to take place between April 15th and November 15th, 2023. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. And that's our show tonight, but check out our live NJ Spotlight News virtual roundtable on Thursday titled, Is Teaching in Trouble? The panel discussion will be moderated by education writer John Mooney and senior correspondent Joanna Gagas, and we'll look at the worrisome signs and possible solutions for the teaching profession here in the state. That's Thursday, December 15th at 4 p.m. To register, head to njspotlightnews.org. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Have some water. Sir. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.